Thank you. We tried to shorten the title of the presentation a little bit uh, in the spirit of moving ahead on this. I'd like to talk about a very uh, controversial subject, and it's certainly been a uh, subject of a lot of discussion during this meeting uh, today. And this has been how orphan drug pricing, which is the lifeblood of keeping this industry alive, will fare in a tightening uh, payer environment. And I'd like to cover a couple of topics today. The first one is the growing concern with orphan drug pricing, uh, sustainability. Uh, this has certainly been a topic that has brought a lot of attention very recently here. Uh, the case for the long-term optimism in this business. We're fundamentally very bullish on the orphan drug business. Uh, we see some changes coming to it, but we're very bullish on this area uh, long-term. Uh, third, the need for greater orphan drug investment selectivity and early commercial validation of your products. I think that the market is going to bifurcate in very important ways and that there will be winners and there will be losers in this market. And that's very important to choose carefully when you're embarking on a uh, development decision in that. And fourth, uh, developing orphan drug products to evidence value. Having value is great, but unless you can present that value and showcase that value to a payer, uh, it's not very meaningful on that. Uh, our perspective comes from uh, 10 years of work in orphan drug strategic pricing uh, and corporate development. As you probably know, this is not an area for those who are adverse to uh, uncertainty. Uh, when you're investing in an orphan drug product, there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty that comes with it. That largely falls in three different buckets. The first is the addressable patient population. In particular, if you're the first one into a market, you really don't know the size of that market ultimately. We can triangulate in from a number of different uh, directions on that to get a credible answer to move forward. But ultimately, you don't really know uh, how big that population is there. Uh, and secondly, that patient population may not be this monolithic block of patients. It may, in fact, be a collection of submarkets of patients with very different characteristics who will use or not use your product uh, as befits their needs for that. The second major bucket here is the pace and extent of market penetration. Uh, it was mentioned earlier today the difficulty and the duration, uh, longevity, in getting a patient to treatment, uh, and we have seen this time and time again where it can be 10 years before a patient is diagnosed or where a patient uh, goes through several misdiagnoses along the way. We recently worked on a project where we had young children who were getting high-dose chemotherapy. They never had cancer. They had been misdiagnosed, moving from physician to physician, each one getting increasingly more desperate. Uh, and this lengthens the amount of time that it takes for you to recruit patients into your uh, eventual uh, financial pool for that. The third and the biggest area, and the one I'd like to focus on today, is the uh, uh, pricing for, uh, the achievable pricing for products here. And this is a function first of the variable orphan premium, uh, which attaches to these products, and then what the longer term reimbursement outlook uh, is for that. Uh, Conceptually, orphan drug prices are set in a way where there is a basic economic value, and then there is a variable premium on top of that. That premium is a number that is subject to great debate uh, and variability. Orphan pricing is really a series of one-off decisions, how you price an individual product into the market as you get into the few more crowded markets, it begins to take on the characteristics of a mature market. But in the main, this is a series of individual pricing decisions that you're making over and over again, where pricing models leave you a little bit hollow on that. Now, there's several things that go into determining what the magnitude of that orphan premium is. And the ones that we've found to be particularly telling here is the population size. And the population certainly correlates very well with the price points that we've seen in the market. We saw some charts on that earlier today. Uh, but in the main, it is not causation there. It's simply a reflection of the financial interest in that. The most important one is the clinical imperative and the treatment alternatives that are available for that. If there is a disease, and we see some extraordinary cruel diseases in the area of uh, orphan drugs, if there is a major need and there is a product that has the potential to address that need, 
uh, that gives you quite a bit of latitude in this marketplace. Some of the other uh, areas that are particularly important in setting the premiums on this are the efficacy. And the efficacy is a function both of the magnitude of the benefit and the proportion of patients that uh, benefit from that drug. If you're prevent, if you're causing survival in 50% of the patients, uh, that's a little bit different than preventing a minor side effect in 3% of the patients. So the, the efficacy is a very variable term uh, along the way there. There's also tangible cost offsets uh, with that, and that really factors into the economic value uh, of the product. And then there's the individual patient vulnerability. Uh, a young child will draw more resources than someone at the end of life uh, in there. Uh, the mechanism of action also is a factor that has been uh, very important uh, in determining that. And there's a certain amount of surface logic in that a replacement factor for a disease is something that is a lot more easy to understand than it is a three steps removed down a series of uh, physiologic changes there. It's a simple case of you're missing a particular uh, enzyme, we can replace that enzyme, that factor. Uh, that has a certain logic to it that is understood well by physicians, understood well by payers, and which tends to lead to uh, premiums that are more acceptable for that. There are several other factors. We've accumulated about 20 over the course of the past several years uh, that have really been driving, and they tend to be individual uh, situations. A, a particular product, one factor may be driving that far more than any other, so it really is a series of one-offs for that. More recently, there has been some concerns with the sustainability of orphan drug pricing, and you're starting to see this spill over now into the, um, even the major uh, medical press on this. Beware the increasing cost and number of orphan drugs coming into the market. And clearly, the rise of orphan drugs is gaining some attention and uh, is something that all of us will need to deal with. Payers have noted to us several concerns with respect to orphan drug pricing. First of all, uh, there is a tsunami of orphan drugs and orphan drug designations coming down the road, and that has been really underscored by the increasing participation of large pharma in this business. When this was a cottage industry of companies, that was a little bit different and perhaps a little less threatening than to have some of your major companies involved. Now that they see the top five companies involved pretty heavily in this area, they're concerned, and they can also see the trail of orphan drug approvals, and more importantly, the orphan drug designations that you know, can cause you to uh, catch your breath if you're on the payer side of the business. Uh, the second issue that draws concern from the part of payers is the uh, price points that are increasing, increasingly routine uh, upper tier price points on that. Uh, products, when products come in at a, you know, starting point of $300,000, and we'll see where we can go from there. And that becomes a little, bit of, a little bit of an issue. Not every product is a Solaris, not every product has that benefit, but you are seeing a fairly stepwise approach in pricing going up there. Uh, there's also some skepticism about the value of some of the orphan drugs uh, that are in development or have come to market. And in some cases, that's not entirely unjustified. There are products that occupy a spectrum of high value to very low value products out there. And there is some concern that uh, owning the label of an orphan drug could be uh, licensed to, uh, for mischief of that. Um, there's difficult, these, from the payer perspective, these are very difficult products to refuse. Uh, there's public relations, there's plan sponsor implications of these products. Uh, no company likes to feel like it's being held uh, you know, hostage to a manufacturer there. Uh, there's also growth occurring at the uh, at time of real benefit, or real, I'm sorry, growth occurring at the time of real budget constraints. And I'm realizing how bad my glasses are at this point of trying to read the screen here. Uh, the uh, growth is occurring in orphan drugs at a time where very worldwide there are very real budget constraints. In the U.S., payers are unable to pass along the cost of benefits as they used to be. There's a ceiling on budgets there. Around the world, the financial uh, situation has put constraints on companies and really forced to make some hard decisions on that. Uh, we've had to make, or many countries have to make, very hard decisions in terms of choosing 
Is it social equity, in which case we take care of every patient with every disease, or is it an opportunity cost situation where we have a finite amount of resources and we're going to expend those resources in the most cost efficient way? Do I vaccinate 25,000 children or do I treat one orphan drug patient? Those are hard decisions uh, to come to grasp with. We've recently completed some work with uh, US payers trying to understand what the long term outlook would be for orphan drugs. Uh, and what we find is that, first of all, the costs are manageable today, but they are starting to appear on the radar screen of just about every major payer. Uh, secondly, that there's concern in avoiding a replay of oncology. Uh, people have lived through that. They've seen costs layer one on top of another. They've seen little back pressure in terms of the utilization of oncology products. And payers, I think, would prefer all else being able to avoid a repeat of that situation there. We're very optimistic, though. We believe that payers will continue to reimburse for high-value orphan drugs in most of the approved indications there. But the payers are becoming more discriminating in what they pay for, and they should. Uh, they're looking for a good faith effort on the part of manufacturers to demonstrate value for that. And the expectations on the part of payers are realistic. They're not unreasonable. Uh, and they understand the trial limitation, si limited size. There's only so much information you can give there. But they would like endpoints to be a little more meaningfully clinically. We can talk about a six-minute walk test, and it makes sense to a cardiologist. But to a payer, it might not make as much sense as a value proposition. We believe that given the rise in products and the inevitable budget constraints that come with that, that there's going to be a sorting out process, a bifurcation of the orphan drug market into, category, into products that are advantaged and products that are less advantaged. The ones that we think will have a great track record going forward will be those that serve the smaller populations, uh, ones where there is genuine therapeutic and economic value. Some of the orphan drug products are extraordinarily effective in terms of reducing ancillary costs. If I can prevent a year of hemodialysis or prevent readmissions uh, or narrow the number of days in a critical care unit, that's got some big advantages and some very big cost uh, benefits to it. Uh, the products that serve the most vulnerable patients and the ones with the longest future lifespan will probably benefit. Those that benefit children. Uh, will probably do better than those that benefit the more aged at this point. And lastly, those with a clear mechanism of action where there is a definable mechanism for why this product delivers its value will probably do better than the ones that begin with, we don't really know how this works, but this is the clinical data that we have for that. On the other side of the table, the ones that we feel that will be less advantaged will be the ones that are legal and regulatory plays, situations where you try to impose your will on the marketplace by limiting the options that uh, a company might have or a payer might have for that. Uh, some of the uh, dubious repositioning work, there is a lot of good value to be had in terms of repurposing uh, products in the market today, but there are some cases where it looks like a real stretch, and I think those will have uh, some difficulties from manufacturers, from payers in the days ahead there. Uh, minor dosage form improvements. Again, there are situations where changes in dosage form can fundamentally alter the characteristics of a product, but not in all cases, and where it's only a minor adjustment to the product without a particularly strong uh, therapeutic benefit from that, I think those will come under pressure there. And lastly, I think the end-of-life therapies will probably face more pressure than not. Uh, we still live in a system where we uh, tend to bucket a lot of the spend at the last year of the patient's life, and if you're trying to take finite dollars and stretch them over the end, over a patient's life cycle, it might make sense to redistribute those a little bit more. So we think the end-of-life ones will, be, will come under some increasing challenge here. And going forward, looking at orphan drug reimbursement and pricing sustainability is going to require a more strategic uh, approach to value management. And manufacturers will be faced with a couple different decisions. First of all, which products to develop for that. Um, 
My glasses really are bad. Uh, I think the early validation of payer viability, uh, of commercial viability on that. Can I ask the gentleman in the back, uh, is there any way you can enlarge that screen a little bit for me? Uh, secondly, increasingly, I apologize. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm not going to use the microphone here, but I do need the slides. I, uh, first of all, under the products to develop, uh, you're going to need to be able to validate the payer commercial vi viability well, the product's coming out early. In order to get funding, in order to get internal agreements to whether to develop or not a particular product, you're gonna need to have early commercial validation of that. That means talking with payers early on in the game to understand, is this something that in payer defined terms truly adds value to the mix? This means walking away from some products, and they're hard to do, but if you conclude that these are not the types of products that are going to offer tremendous value to payers at a price point that you're comfortable with advancing them on, you need to take some hard decisions with that. Secondly, it's going to be increasingly essential for funding purposes to have that kind of validation early on there. VCs or strategic partners are going to be looking to know the story from you that you've been out there, that you've tested this with payers, and that you've gotten a very good feedback or, uh, as to the fundability of these going forward. Uh, the second bucket of issues here is going to be how to develop these assets for maximum value yield. Uh, this involves, in the case of multi-indication uh, products, the uh, selection of the indications that you choose to develop in a way that tries to preserve the maximum amount of value across the product. Uh, the choice of patient submarkets. Where do I go? in a particular orphan disease, do I go after the highest acuity sector of that, or do I go after the broad base of that? Those may have very different implications in terms of what's required, in terms of clinical results, and in terms of what's implied in terms of pricing for those. And third, looking at dosage form strategies to help articulate the value a little more clearly. And these are decisions that you're going to have to make early on in the game. Third. Uh, the question would be how to evidence the value that's created. Creating a tremendous amount of value is great, but if you can't document that value in a payer-relevant way, you're behind the eight ball on that. That means building in, first of all, non-confounding uh, economic outcomes. And by non-confounding, I mean you don't want to put measures in place that take the basic uh, trial and compromise that. You don't want to compromise the medical component of that. But you do want to start to build in factors that will give payers a better understanding of how this product could actually work uh, in the marketplace. Uh, and then secondly, to ensure that your outcomes are payer relevant, to speak in the language of payers, to speak in the language of value, rather than strictly in terms of therapeutics. I think orphan drug pricing is really a balancing act here. Strategic, strong pricing is going to be absolutely essential to continued investment in this area. Uh, after 10 years of this work, working with dozens of different manufacturers in the area, I, I'm categorically of the belief that the success of the high price, low volume patient market has really been the key factor in unlocking investment in the orphan drug market more than any other factor. The exclusivity is nice, some of the tax benefits are nice, but if you can't get the right price for your product, it's really a, uh, it's a non-starter for that. Uh, the clinical risks in orphan drugs are likely to increase rather than decrease going forward. We've had a situation where a number of the early products were extremely well defined clinically. It was just a question, can we make these products in sufficient quantities? Can we bring the recombinant technologies to bear that allows these to be made in large quantities? Uh, we're further and further out now into the higher risk uh, areas of drug development. Uh, and finally, the exclusivity period uh, should be considered as an offset to pricing on this. We have a seven-year period right now in the U.S., which is great. That may be extended longer to help offset some of the pricing pressures for that. That's what's required from the payers and from the funders. The obligation of the manufacturers, on the other hand, is to have products that offer genuine value into the marketplace here. And your orphan drug designation simply isn't a license to uh, 
ignore practical economics. You've got to be able to price to value on that. Uh, we're working with some very interesting products right now. In terms of micro orphans, less than 1,000 patients worldwide, uh, which have price points that are where you would probably expect them to be. Gene therapy, which has implications uh, in terms of how you price this. We think that some of these types of orphan products may now begin to call into question the fundamental uh, pricing and economic model for the pharmaceutical industry, it maybe lead to some innovation in that. We've had you know, 50, 60 years of using the same model for that, and I think it's getting a little bit stretched uh, at this point. In conclusion, uh, the success of orphan drugs has created some counterforces that may challenge the market, and, and it's clear you're seeing that mentioned by payers, you're seeing that in the press right now. Uh, payers are likely, though, to continue to reimburse for high value orphan products at attractive prices. I think there's a sense that we're all in this together, that without high prices, uh, there will be no drugs. And it's a Hobson's choice. We have expensive drugs or we have no drugs at all. And I hope we make the decision to move in the, the direction of, to have those drugs. Uh, the payer demands will inquire increasingly, uh, increasing investment discrimination uh, by the developers. You're going to need to choose your shots a lot more carefully than you have in the past and develop products that have true economic value to them. Uh, investors will increasingly require evidence of payer validation before funding. You need to understand that this part will be commercially viable in the market before you go forward. And lastly, assets need to be developed with early attention to evidencing the payer relevant value markers. Uh, as you develop these products, it's not enough to wait to phase three or the close of phase three to start doing your pharmacoeconomic modeling. You need to be able to start building some of this in at early phases of uh, the work. And I thank you very much, and I appreciate your uh, putting up with the uh, mobile presentation here. Thank you very much.